Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nerdy 30s Review. I'm Jason and today we're finally jumping into our review for the Intel Arc A770 16GB Limited Edition Graphics Card. That's right, I know it's been a hot minute and I do apologize for that. It's just been a bonker season for me at work, but I'm really happy to have had the opportunity to do a really thorough deep dive into this graphics card because honestly there's a lot to unpack. Where it sits now versus where it was launched at, like I think it's actually closer to its, you know, their reported performance, what they were hoping for when they initially released the graphics card, but it still kind of fits into this odd place. And, and we'll get into that into the benchmarks and the final thoughts, but just preliminarily, like the first things that I noticed as soon as I jumped in, as soon as I got it installed and I got the drivers installed, um, there, there was a lot. Um, Performance was was still pretty inconsistent, uh, and I say this as far as like overall frame rates and frame times, game to game between 1080p and 1440p, and and that's okay. Like you'll see that across the board, regardless of you know whether it's an Nvidia or an AMD or an Intel graphics card. So that didn't disturb me too much. The things that I noticed um, on the positive side of things uh, are that driver support was actually really impressive. It it outpaced much of what I was expecting not just in uh, overall performance, but in uh, driver support. And I was genuinely impressed with the strides that Intel has taken. Now, granted, I wasn't there on day one. Like I had no idea, like I didn't have any firsthand experience of just how big a train wreck that was. Although I'd read reports and seen, you know, every review on YouTube about how it launched. And I'm, I'm happy to say that that was not my experience at all. At 1080p, I had no problem at all with any game that I was playing. There, there was no real issues outside of one outlier with a, a pretty substantial 1% low. And we'll get into that uh, in the benchmarks, obviously. But on the other side of things, um, a few things that I noticed that kind of concerned me was uh, idle power draw and idle temperatures are a lot higher than I would expect out of a graphics card that only uses one eight pin connector and one six pin. And it, that translated, I, I won't say that it was a very power hungry card. It was just, it was more power hungry than I'd anticipated it being for, you know, yet again, for the eight pin and, and six pin. That said, um, there, there wasn't really a, that substantial of a power spike, the peak power performance on a like four hour binge of Returnal at 1440p max settings. Like I didn't see anything that concerned me and really impressively for, for it being a stock like reference card, it was really quiet. Like a subs it was just a really, really quiet card. Even when I was just pushing it to its absolute limits, um, I I'd never really heard the fans really ramp up over um, like my case fans. And that's gotta be, I mean, that's a testament to the Intel's ingenuity there uh just holding it in my hand and when i installed it you can really tell that it's a quality quality graphics card and and i i really appreciate that uh kind of on the other side of like the driver um unfortunately i ran into uh quite a few issues uh with uh, a handful of games when i would launch the application even after like manually changing the i and i for for the games that i was playing uh, the one that immediately leaps to mind was Forspoken. And then there were a couple others as well where it didn't matter like what I'd scaled it as. It would automatically, uh, it would go out of full screen mode into windowed mode. And that's even with me changing the I and I and the settings inside uh, to fit it to the scale that I wanted to play it at. Um, and eventually like I could just go back into settings and then reset it and it would be fine, but it was kind of a pain in the neck. Spider-Man remastered. That was the other one. And it was, it was kind of odd. I would launch the application. I would play at like 1080p and 1440p. And then I would, you know, come back and I'd go for another benchmark and it would automatically resize, which was kind of a pain. I hadn't run into that in, uh, with any other graphics card before. So uh, the other thing that I noticed on the driver side of things was the actual software itself. When it would check for updates, it would it would go forever and ever and ever. And then I would get this little notification and I would get the notification immediately after powering on um, powering on my system, getting Windows running. It would tell me that it could not connect to uh, Intel's driver servers. And we don't know if you're on the current version. 
And this happened over the course of three separate updates. And the only way I found that I could actually correct this connectivity issue was to completely uninstall the software and reinstall it from the most recent driver set. And it was, I know, like they're still, you know, working things out. But unfortunately, it was just one of those things that I noticed that was kind of a pain. Uh, outside of that, I don't really have any gripes. It's a phenomenal graphics card for where it fits. But the question is, where does it fit? Um, is it a 1080p graphics card? Is it a 1440p graphics card? It doesn't quite. You'll, you'll see in the performance metrics. Uh, we'll go over a brief overview of the software overclocking process like we did with the uh, XFX review that I did. Then we'll get right into synthetic benchmarks and uh, of course gameplay benchmarks. I, I really wanted to do a detailed dive into 1080p versus 1440p, impact of that upscaling, uh, impact of ray tracing. I really wanted to take XCSS for a spin. So we've got some benchmarks there. And then of course, power draw and we'll have final thoughts. Um, it's it's an interesting card for where it sits and if it sits right on the price I I, I think it's it's a pretty exciting card um, that's really all the the rambling I need to do here at the intro and let's uh, just get into the software okay to access your Intel Arc software I think it's called Intel Arc control it's very much the same as like if you were trying to get into adrenaline or GeForce experience just go to your hidden icons tray on the system tray find it right click and open the software now this is your welcome screen. Uh, it'll have a, a basic outline of, of where you might want to go. Um, I'll go ahead and try to check for updates and uh, you'll, you'll see, kind of see what I'm talking about. And then it, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just kind of an annoyance. You'll get a little pop up here in a few seconds saying, hey, we're still trying to connect. And then invariably you'll get a message that says we were unable. Yep, yeah, there it is. We're still checking. Um, and and it's, it's not a big deal. It's just kind of a minor gripe, you know? And the other kind of thing that's not super great is I played easily a dozen more games than are listed here, but for whatever reason, the software didn't pick them up. You can manually add them, but if, and I personally prefer to adjust settings in game, but like if, if they're wanting to be the next GeForce experience or adrenaline software, they're going to have to up their game here a little bit. Um, performance tab is likely where you're going to spend most of your time. I do really appreciate the live performance monitoring. If you do want to go ahead and um, do any kind of overclocking, you basically just need to go into your performance tuning configure menu. Now, before I go any further, we'll have the same disclaimer. This card performs amazingly at stock. All of the benchmarks that you're going to see are at stock. So there's there's no obligation to overclock. You may get you may squeeze out that little extra bit of performance um, running this at around 27, 2750 megahertz, which I believe is the peak clock for this card. You just want to put it in the stock, install the software and game by all means, just do it. But for those of you who do want to do some overclocking, at least using um, uh, arc control rather than something like MSI afterburner. Basically all you would want to do is first unlock your power limit, much like the others. Um, the 90 C limit, I have never seen it hit. So I had no problem just leaving it there. I would recommend, um, either going with a fixed fan target or uh, like manually adjust your curve. You can be a little bit more aggressive with it. I choose to be um, if I'm overclocking a, a smaller card, just a dual fan card, um, but you, I didn't have any problem with the stock fan curve, truthfully. So, I mean, your mileage is going to vary, but obviously go a little more aggressive and then like tune it down from there. If, if you're going to, um, if you're going to overclock this card, in my opinion, the next thing you want to do is get a stable GPU voltage offset. For me, that was 110. Uh, I've seen people get one t uh, 120, 130, but for me, when I started adjusting core clock here, uh, like GPU core performance, once we crested 20, I kind of reached this point where it would crash, but I wouldn't get that, that 2700, 2750 megahertz in game. So for me, 110 was stable, and then I was able to bring uh, core, bore core performance to around uh, 25 is I think it was 27 what I actually set it at and got my my 2750. But your mileage is going to vary, obviously, but then you can just apply the differences and then you're off and running. If you do run across a crash, um, you can just reset the defaults and it goes right back to where it was. 
display settings are pretty straightforward. I've got my monitor and then I've, I've of course got my capture card there. And then studio, I didn't really play too much in because honestly, I didn't feel comfortable stressing the card in that way. And I've just had such rubbish experience utilizing the, the GPU software suite for recording. So like shadow play or whatever Radeon's equivalent is. So, I mean, I can do that if, if you guys are really interested in that, but truthfully, like I just didn't touch it and it's not really part of the review, but they do have a feature set. If you want to dink around on it, obviously go nuts. It looks pretty intuitive. Um, but I mean, for me, it's capture card and OBS. All right, before we dive on into benchmarks, let's just go ahead and familiarize ourselves with the test system. Uh, for the processor, we've got a Ryzen 9 7950X3D. The cooler is a deep cool LS520 white AIO. Full disclosure, I swapped out the stock fans with some Noctua high static pressure 120s. Um, the motherboard is an MSI Carbon Wi-Fi X670E. It was a pleasure to build on. I, I'm really enjoying the newer boards by MSI. Uh, GPU is obviously the Intel Arc A770 16 gigabyte limited edition. Driver version for the benchmarks was 31.0.101.4672. The RAM we've got is a 2 by 16 gigabyte kit of G-Skill Trident Z5 Neo set to Expo 6000. Uh, primary game drive was Samsung 990 Pro 2 terabyte M.2 SSD. The case is a Fractal North chalk white mesh. Uh, intake cooling, I had two 140 millimeter Arctic PWM fans, and the exhaust cooling, I have one 120 millimeter Noctua NF S12A. This is a really, really nice build, a quiet build. I really enjoyed building it, and so far, gaming on it has been amazing. Uh, we're going to move on over to synthetics to start. And we just went with the full 3D Mark suite, uh, Fire Strike, which is DirectX 11 at 1080p max settings. We had a score of 31,599. We took a dip down to Fire Strike Extreme, and that's essentially the same settings, only at 1440p with a score of 15,390. Moving over to Time Spy, we had a DirectX 12 max settings, result of 13,521. Port Royal is 3D Mark's ray tracing performance benchmark and we had a score of 7067 which although it's a low number i was genuinely impressed with uh, intel's first go in ray tracing performance we'll get into that later and then speedway is directx 12 ultimate benchmark it includes ray tracing so we had a score there of 2414. now moving over to 1080p benchmarks uh, maximum settings no ray tracing no upscaling this is just 100 rasterized performance uh, Cyberpunk 2077, we had an uh, average frame rate of 75 frames per second with 1% lows at 34. Ghostwire Tokyo performed admirably with 104 frames per second uh, maximum settings and uh, 57 in 1% lows. Returnal was at 68 frames per second on the Epic preset with no ray tracing, uh, 28 um, in the 1% lows. This was mostly due to uh, environmental. Basically, the, the whole environment is, is largely... Um, destructible and so like if you really go after it it can kill your frames on any graphics card honestly uh for spoken was our outlier here uh 65 frames per second 1080p max setting no retracing uh 12 1 percent lows it was stuttery in a lot of different regions and the frame time graph was all over the place i kind of wish i'd recorded that it was it was just kind of a mess both at 20 1080p and 1440p Bouncing back in Spider-Man Remastered, we had a really strong showing at 112 frames per second with 64 in the 1% lows. It was a really smooth experience. The Last of Us is challenging for any graphics card. So uh, 55 frames per second is, we were hoping for the 60, but I'll take 55. It was really smooth performance. And the 1% lows were, were in and around where you'd expect at 33. Baldur's Gate 3, uh, it's kind of a top-down isometric game, so it's not really GPU intensive, but 94 frames per second at 1080p max settings is admirable with 67 in the 1% lows. Our highest frame rate uh, came out of Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 119. 1% uh, lows were really, really low in certain sections of the game, specifically the jungle and more densely populated areas, uh, and I'd, I'd see it dip around 25 um, Hogwarts Legacy performed really well, 1080p max settings um, at 63 frames per second and a tight 1% low at 46. 
Uh, moving on over to 1440p, the same suite. Cyberpunk, we saw go down to 53 frames per second with 26 um, one, in the 1% lows. Ghostwire Tokyo down to 72 with 37 in the 1% lows. Returnal at 54 and uh, 38 1% lows, respectively. For Spoken, the trend continued, unfortunately. We dropped below 60 frames per second overall with three frames per second in the 1% low. They, it, it was a stuttery mess in some areas. and. I tested and retested, reinstalled the game. I, I, I adjusted values. It wasn't until I applied upscaling that that kind of normalized. So that's a bit of a shame there. Uh, Spider-Man Remastered just continues to crush it. 85 frames per second, 1440p max settings uh, with 1% lows at 55. The Last of Us, we did see the largest percentage-wise drop in performance, but low numbers to low numbers from 50-some to 30 and 1% uh, lows at 21. Baldur's Gate 3 keeps it strong at 79 frames per second, 43 in the 1% lows. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, 86 frames per second. And honestly, the 1% lows in the same regions were higher at 1440p than 1080p. I switched back and double checked. Uh, there, there might be an anomaly somewhere, either in my testing or just um, just it, maybe it's just the card. I don't know. It was it's worth noting, though. Hogwarts Legacy did drop below 60 frames per second down to 42, but 1% lows stayed tight at 32. I'm going to go into a brief comparison between the two just to kind of show you um, something that I really appreciated. So although we had a lot of variance between games, so, you know, any game is, is going to be more graphically intensive or, or less so or more taxing or less so on a graphics card. But when you scale up, when you're going from 1080p to 1440p, like I really appreciated from this cards the fact that we were, I mean, outside of one outlier or two outliers, sorry, um, we were between 20 and 30 percent. And it's it's not spectacular, but the consistency is what I appreciated. So Cyberpunk um, 2077, we had a 29.3 loss in overall frames. Um, and Cyber, or sorry, Ghostwire Tokyo, we had 30.8. Returnal, we had 20.5. Forspoken, just a flat 20%. Um, Spider-Man Remastered, we lost 23.5% of our frames. The Last of Us, this is a percentage-wise, though. So although the numbers don't look that different, um, it's because it was such a small number to start with, down to 30. Yeah, 45.5 frame, uh, frames... 45.5% of your frames lost is, is substantial. Um, Baldur's Gate, which is such a low impact game, I, I don't think it really took much to scale. So we only saw a 16% degradation there. Rise of the Tomb Raider 27.7 and of course Hogwarts Legacy 33.3. Repeating, of course. <laughs> um, <clears throat> percentage lost. So there's there's something to be said here. Uh, I see in in my experience, like with the 7900 XTX, I would see like really inconsistent um, drop offs in performance when I would go from 1440p to 4K, uh, depending on title. And I, I I guess it's just it's heartening to see that we've got a consistent baseline because when when you're purchasing a card for a specific resolution and maybe you want to upgrade your monitor, you know, a couple of months down the road and you think, can this GPU handle it? What can I expect? Like having a good consistent um, expectation, I think is is a boon for, for Intel. Now, moving on to ray tracing performance, I just tested it at 1080p, uh, mostly because we were so close to 60 frames per second um, across the 1440p results that I really didn't want to dip below. Like I wanted to kind of test what I could and still have playable frames, essentially. Um, so starting at 1080p um, in Cyberpunk 2077, um, we had 78 frames per second just rasterized, but then when we incorporated uh, ray tracing into it, um, we lost about 37.1%, so down to 49 frames per second. But still, it was a smooth experience at around 50 frames per second. Um, Ghostwire Tokyo was able to stay up above 60 frames per second, going down to 67, and that was a loss of about 35.6%. Uh, for Spoken, we dipped from 65 frames per second down to 50. It was a lot less intensive than I thought it was going to be, uh, an overall loss of 23.1%. <laughs> And then, of course, Plague Tale Requiem, I realized it wasn't in the previous benchmarks. I had some stability issues, and I didn't feel confident putting those in my 1080p and 1440p overall benchmarks. So just for the sake of ray tracing, I was able to test this confidently. Um, and so, yeah, we went from 90 frames to 60 frames. It's nice and even, another 33.3, repeating, of course. Um, 
perform uh percentage of performance lost so i gotta say like for the first shot out of the barrel for intel's um ray tracing performance i think this is impressive i i it's not spectacular and no you're not going to crush any game at 1440p or 4k um max settings and ray tracing that's not what this card is for but at 1080p like if you want to enable some ray tracing features in it in a game that you're playing 1080p on a 300 dollars graphics card i i think there's something to be said here so then i wanted to really uh stretch xcs's legs uh they kind of have a limited games library currently supporting xcss I want to say it's around 50 in total, but in my benchmarking suite, I was able to grab a handful of them here that actually had XCSS as an option for upscaling. So 1440p max setting, no ray tracing. Uh, in Cyberpunk 2077, we were able to go from 53 to 61 frames per second, an increase of 13.1%. Oh, and brief note here, the, the XCSS preset is the ultra quality. Uh, in all instances. Uh, next up is Ghostwire Tokyo. And we went from 72 frames per second all the way up to 103. And it looked really, really good. Truth be told, I, I could hardly tell. I had to really look in some situations. Like when the rain was really heavy. And I would look to like a change in light. Then I could start to see some artifacts or just some <clears throat> some not quite right things. But overall, it was it was a beautiful experience. Uh, Returnal, we went from 54 frames per second way up to 73, an increase of 26%, and it looked beautiful. For Spoken, 52 to 60, so it's only an increase of 13.3% in overall average frames per second. But what this really rectified in my experience was the just criminally low, 1% uh, lows. It, it made the the flame the. Th the frame time graph stopped jumping around and it was a much smoother experience with XCSS. I would I would truthfully say that if you want to play Forspoken on an Intel graphics card right now, unless they patch it, you know, just on this particular driver set, I would say just enable XCSS or it's going to drive you crazy. Moving on over to power draw and thermals. So like I said, idle power draw is higher than I, I would expect out of such a small graphics card. It's it's a two fan card using an eight pin and a six pin 42 watts is is higher than my 7900 xtx draws at idle so just kind of a frame of reference there um under load and this when i say load it was about a four hour like um marathon session of returnal at 1440p max settings so 209 that was uh, that's a good power draw in my opinion uh peak power i only saw 120 millisecond spike of around 260 262 is what i had documented i, I think i saw it jump up a little higher and, and crest a little lower at times but right about there as far as thermals go at idle 49 celsius and under load the the gpu the highest i ever saw it get was 84 vram it ran a bit hotter uh, at 52 at idle and then 88 degrees at Celsius. Um, it's right up against that 90 degree threshold, you know, just a couple of degrees difference, but it never hit it um, in in all of the, the stress testing that I put it through. So like fair play to Intel as far as like keeping things as cool as possible on what seems to be kind of a hot chip. Okay, so closing everything out, the last thing we'll want to talk about is price. Now, given where it, sits and it's it's like right in that right in that crevice between 1080p and 1440p gaming uh like it crushes everything that i threw at it with you know one or two exceptions max settings 1080p the performance was was incredible i, I think the software feature sets in xcss were very admirable moving up into 1440p and i think once you applied that upscaling and this is ultra quality upscaling that we used like 1440p looks good um, but in my opinion, like once you start reaching that point where you start scaling like settings back or like start using upscaling technology to hit the resolution that you're paying for, I think that you should also start scaling what you're willing to pay back. Now, that said, um, at least right now on Newegg, uh, you can get the Acer Bifrost um, 16 gigabyte for 339, I believe. Then the ASRock Phantom Gaming, which is a really good model for 329. And then finally, you can uh, get the Sparkle Titan for 319. And truthfully, that is that's where I would cap it. Like I would not 
I, if, if you wanted the Acer Bifrost, I would wait for a sale. I would not spend any more than $330 on this. And I know it's like an arbitrary number, but I feel like once you start cresting that 350, there are other options out there that perform better at 1440p that have more developed driver sets. And I mean, granted, they're, they're previous generations. So we're talking about like the 6700 or the 6750 XT. And if you bump another 50 bucks and you're in the $400 price range, at that point, you can go with the 6800 and it's, it's like night and day. That is just like a rasterization of 1440p graphics card max settings, no compromises. And, and that's fine. Um, if you want to support Intel, like if, if you're kind of fed up between this weird, like interlocking price point thing that we've got going on between NVIDIA and AMD, like I, I have no problems recommending this card. I don't, it's, it's a great card. I had a really good time benchmarking it. Uh, I believe that their drivers need some maturation. I believe that, um, power draw, at least at idle is a concern. I feel like for as long as the graphics card's been out, um, they would have remedied that by now, or maybe it's just part of the architecture. It's how it works. I'm, I'm not an engineer. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's just been my experience. And, and typically when a card runs hotter or draws more power at idle, it just doesn't last as long. But that's anecdotal. I, I've only had this card for a few months. Um, as for, for where it sits, at those price points, I think it's a great recommendation. Honestly, I know that XCSS has to expand. It's only in about 50 games right now. but Truthfully, if you can get in this card around that $300 to $320 price range, it's a phenomenal card. I I loved it at 1080p. I really liked it at 1440p. Uh, the smoothness of the frames like in those max setting games and XCSS looks sharp. I'm excited to see where XCSS goes. I'm excited to see where Intel goes in the GPU market. Truthfully, I think the Battle Mage uh, lineup, if they... If they are to be believed, if like the reports and the rumors that I hear have it rumbling around 4080 performance at the price point they're whispering, I am very excited for Intel. And that's truthfully how I can really, really recommend this graphics card to somebody around the $300 price point. If you're looking for no compromise 1080p performance and some scaling back at 1440 uh, to, to hit that magic 60 frames per second. But um those are my thoughts. I, I think it's a, a good graphics card. I, I would recommend it to, to anyone entry level. Um, maybe entry level, you've built PCs before and you can wrangle with the software. You, you feel comfortable uninstalling and reinstalling drivers. If, if, you're, if you're new to just like gaming PCs as a whole, maybe go with one of the more um, developed driver set uh, manufacturers. So uh, AMD or NVIDIA. Um, but other than that, yeah, 100% recommend. Um, but those are my thoughts and I'd love to hear yours. Have you tried the Intel Arc? Like what's been your experience? Uh, are you excited for Battle Mage? What would you say that your, what would you say your top end price point is for 1080p and 1440p? Cause that's, it's, it's such a muddled thing. I'd love to have a sit down discussion with you about it. Um, but that's really all I've got. So I really, really appreciate uh, you taking the time to watch the video. I can't thank you enough for all the support the channel's got. You guys are an amazing collective of people. Uh, I love interacting with you. If you enjoy the content, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. It, it helps me more than you know. I've got so much more content coming. I can't wait for the next reveal. Uh, but yeah, you guys are amazing. I hope you have a fantastic day. And I'll see you in the next one.